Now, I'd like to take a moment and talk to you about 12 common mistakes that new woodworkers make. First of all, let me say this. As far as I'm concerned, if the technique gets the job done, doesn't damage your tool, and is safe, it's a good technique. So let's talk about these 12 common mistakes that I've discovered that new woodworkers make. I'll confess right now to you, I made them all. Number one, expecting too much from yourself. Now, woodworking is a skill and it takes time to acquire. I haven't seen anybody that grabbed a saw or a hammer or drill the very first time and used it perfectly, okay? You know, the old joke about hitting your thumb with a hammer or bending the nails over with a hammer, that old joke exists because it's real. We all do it. It takes time to learn everything we do in woodworking. So give yourself that time. Don't expect yourself to be perfect. Woodworking is about what you can do, not how well or how perfectly you avoid mistakes. Number two, buying cheap tools. Tools, like everything else in life, you kind of get what you pay for. And if you buy cheap tools, you're gonna to get cheap tools. Now here's the problem. Some tools, when they're cheap, they just don't last. On the other hand, there are tools that are inexpensive that do last. Now, a lot of that depends on how much you personally are going to use the tool, okay? I've got two different brands of drills here. This is a Milwaukee, which is, in my opinion, probably the best brand of handheld cordless power tools out there. And this is a Ryobi, which is a very good consumer brand with a very reasonable price. I would never take this on a construction job site if I was a professional carpenter because I don't feel it's heavy duty enough for that kind of work. That's what this is for. But as a home woodworker, you know, Ryobi is a great brand. On the other hand, there are some brands that can be considered off brands or really cheap brands as opposed to budget friendly. There's a bit of a difference there. And you buy them and they're not going to last. I've probably thrown away three cordless drills be that I bought from before I finally decided if I keep this up, I may as well buy myself a really expensive cordless drill and make sure it's going to last. So avoid cheap tools. Avoid stuff that's not well made. That's really what you're looking for, not the price but how well made it is. Problem number three is the opposite, and that's buying tools that are too expensive for your needs. Going back to our two drills here. Now, Grant, these are two different types of drills, and they're used differently, okay? But they're both drills. This is a professional grade tool. Now, of all the handheld power tools in your workshop, the one you'll probably use the most is a drill. So it makes sense to buy a good drill. But how good? I recently replaced my cordless drill, which the brand does not show up here on my workbench anywhere with this one and the reason i did is because it died all right it died after at least a decade of pretty hefty use in that case i didn't buy an expensive enough tool so when i replaced it i bought the milwaukee because i think they're excellent tools and i know it's going to get a lot of use on the other hand a right angle drill like this one which is designed for use in tight spaces is not something i use very frequently so i don't need the milwaukee for this one so that's a place where I could maybe be buying something that's too expensive. You can spend a lot of money at tools, especially when you start looking at some of the tools that are used in cabinet shops or professional woodworking shops or even furniture factories. You know, you can spend ten or $15,000 on one stationary tool like a table saw. As much as I would like to have one of those saws, I don't have the room for it and I really would never get the full use out of it. Is it worth it for me to spend that kind of money? No, it's not. Finding that right point between buying too cheap and buying too expensive, it can be tricky. Problem number four, not adjusting your tools properly. Now this is especially true of stationary power tools, not so much as handheld tools. When you get a tool straight from the factory and you unbox it and you do whatever assembly is necessary to set it up, don't count on it being dialed in accurately. They do adjust them in the factory, but they probably only adjust them to a certain point and shipping and vibration can cause it to go out of adjustment. When you get that tool set up, the first thing you've got to do is dial it in. What I mean by that is making sure that things are perpendicular and parallel and level like they need to be, okay? Well, the table saw. Is your table saw, when it's at zero degrees of bevel, really at zero degrees of bevel? Have you stuck a square up there next to it to make sure it's really vertical? Is the fence really parallel to that blade? Band saws are tricky to set up. You've got to have the blade right centered on the wheel. You've got to have the table parallel with the blade. You've got to have the roller set up right. There's a lot that goes into setting up a bandsaw. And if you try and cut anything on it, especially something like re resawing, and you haven't got it dialed in just right, all you're going to do is make scrap. So there's the basic adjustment that goes with getting a new tool and getting it set up. But then there's a specific setup when you're doing a particular project, when you're doing a particular cut or whatever. 
Are you sure that that thing is dialed in correctly? Did you take your table saw and bevel the blade to say 45 degrees or even 30 degrees using the miter gauge on printed on the front of the table saw? Or did you check it with some accurate tools, a digital tool of some sort to make sure it's really accurate? So adjustment is important. Number five, it's not using guides so that you can cut straight. Now, woodworking has changed through the years. Back when I was started, there was no such thing as a track saw. Uh, there was no such thing as the idea of making a homemade track saw so that you can make a straight cut and a sheet of plywood using your circular saw. We did it by eye. It was close enough for carpentry work. It was within a quarter of an inch, but it sure wasn't close enough for cabinet work. Nowadays, we use track saws. We, if you don't have a track saw, you make a homemade track saw, or you just take and, and clamp a piece of straight piece of metal, straight piece of wood to it. Use that for a guide for the shoe of your circular saw to ride along so you can get a straight cut. I have pretty much given up on freehanding anything. Okay, pretty much everything I do, I use some sort of guide, whether it's something I've made or something I've bought. I'm talking about things for setting my heights, setting my depths, setting my angles, making straight cuts, even taking a drill and making a, a perpendicular hole into a piece of wood. I'll use some sort of guide. I believe in guides. Why? Because my eye and my hand aren't as accurate as I think they are. That's the truth of the situation. Can you get good enough that you can drill that hole perpendicular into the board? Yeah, I think you can, but I doubt you'll succeed. And I doubt, I really doubt you'll succeed every single time. So take the time, invest the money in guides. Like I said, even if they're shop built guides. Number six, using dull bits and especially blades. You know, we buy circular saw blades or, or table saw blades and they're carbide tip these days and we think they'll last forever. No, they don't. If you're getting a lot of tear out, you're getting a lot of rough edges on your cuts, probably are using a dull blade. Especially if you're cutting into pine, whether you're drilling into it or cutting it. Pine is notorious for tear out, whether we're talking about drill holes, where we're talking about a cross cut, it's horrible. Pine is horrible for tear out because it's a soft wood. Here's a good one for you, for getting the saw kerf. Now, the saw kerf is the amount of wood that's cut out by your saw blade. I don't care if you're talking about a band saw or a table saw or a hand saw, you're gonna have some saw kerf. Yeah, on that band saw, it's not gonna be much. It's gonna be less than a 16th of an inch. On a table saw, it's gonna be about an eighth of an inch. So you're gonna make something, you're gonna make it two feet. And so you can say, oh, I can get four two foot pieces out of an eight foot sheet of plywood or an eight foot board. Oh, no, you can't because you're gonna lose three eighths of an inch in saw curve. You should always give yourself a little extra material anyway, but when you're adding things up, when you're figuring things out, remember saw curve. Using lumber that's not properly dried. Now this may not seem like something that you never think of or never bother you or never happened to you. Don't count on the wood you get from the lumber yard being properly dried. I would highly recommend buying a moisture meter. Even a cheap moisture meter is gonna give you an idea of how much moisture is in that wood. You should be working with wood that's about a 12% moisture content. If it's any higher than that, then it's gonna shrink on you. And when it shrinks, it may warp or twist. You can actually build with that high moisture content lumber, but keep in mind that it's going to change as it shrinks, all right? I know a lot of wood turners that only turn green wood, high moisture content wood. So they'll turn, they'll rough turn, say a bowl with high moisture content wood, then they'll take and they'll seal the wood, put it in a paper bag, put it away for a year, literally a year, let it finish drying out, and then take it back out and put it back on their lathe and finish turning. And in that year, what's happened is that wood has shrunk and the process, the round bowl is probably a little bit oval right now, but they'll turn it with a thick enough wall that they can get it back round again. Okay, so yes, there are places and times for using high moisture content wood, but for by and large, you want to use wood that is dry. When you bring that wood home from the lumber yard, let it sit in your workshop for two or three days before you use it so it can acclimate. The moisture content in the wood will be equal to the moisture content in your workshop. That should be a given. You always let the wood acclimate before you start using it, okay? Number nine, not creating a plan or a drawing before cutting. I used to be really bad at this. I'd have an idea in my head and I'm great at visualizing things and I'd have an idea and I'd have some rough dimensions in my head and I'd start cutting and I made a lot of scrap that way. I cut a lot of pieces too short or I cut the wrong pieces or I cut pieces twice and miss cutting something else. You should always work to a plan. Even if it's a plan that's just sketched out on a piece of computer paper and it's rough, something that's got, these are the pieces I need, this is how they go together, and this is their size. Now, Sawinary has a great tool for this. For those of us that don't do this stuff on computer, and I highly recommend using their project planning tool. Even if you don't have that, 
take a piece of paper, take a ruler, sketch it out, figure out your dimensions. That's the biggie, figure out the dimensions. How big does this piece need to be so that it fits together with that piece? It may not seem like a big deal, but you're more likely to mess up that calculation when you're working on it in the workshop and trying to figure it out so you can cut that piece than you are when you're sitting there at your dining room table or your desk drawing it out. Number 10 working only in pine and not in hardwoods. Now, almost all of us start out working in pine, you know, the stuff we can get at the lumber yard, even dimensional lumber, construction lumber, construction plywood. And I've made a ton of stuff using that wood. Then I started working with hardwoods and I found out it was a whole nother world. Hardwoods are both easier and harder to work with. They're harder in the sense that they are physically harder, more dense woods, and so they're harder to cut. They're easier in the sense that they cut clean, much cleaner than pine does. But there's also a huge difference in how the pieces go together. If you want to do something like dovetail joints, don't try and doing it with pine. It's not going to work. You can't cut pine that cleanly. You can cut maple that cleanly, walnut that cleanly, even poplar, which I think is about the, the lowest cost hardwood you can buy. Use a combination of different types of wood. Now, I realize hardwoods are more expensive and that's what kept me from using hardwoods for a lot of years. I used pine because I could afford pine. All right, and there's some projects that really make sense to make out of pine. If you're making shelves for your workshop, don't do it out of walnut, okay? That'd be a waste of walnut. Go ahead and do it out of pine. Number 11, an unwillingness to try something new. You know, woodworking is a learning experience. You never get there. I've been at this for 50 years, ever since I started with my dad in the garage of our home, and I've learned a lot along the way. And I have to say, I'm still learning. I haven't gotten there yet. And I really doubt that I ever will. Am I a better woodworker now than I was then? Absolutely, no question about it. Am I as good as some of the guys who I watch their videos? No, I'm not. I don't claim to be the best and I don't think I ever will be the best. I enjoy the learning process. So there's a lot of different things you can do in woodworking and give yourself the opportunity to, to try something new. And finally, the last thing I'd like to say is leaving your workshop full of sawdust. Now that may not seem like a mistake. Going out to your workshop and the first thing you gotta do is clean, yeah, that's a bummer. Going out there and you can't do what you wanna do because your workbench is full of other stuff, yeah, that's a bummer too. Going out to your workshop and not being able to find something because it's buried under sawdust. I've seen some workshops that are that bad. I like to leave my workshop relatively clean. Now if you look around here, you'll see sawdust. There's sawdust on the floor. There's sawdust sitting on, there's even sawdust sitting on that. There's sawdust on my tools here. I'm not talking sparkling clean. I'm not talking about white glove clean. I'm just talking about sweep it up, man. Get all the sawdust out of the way, clear off your workbench, be ready for the next project. That way when you go back in, you can go right to work on what it is you wanna do. But there's another reason for that too, and that's called safety. Sawdust is highly flammable. So leaving piles of sawdust all over the floor is a fire hazard. And the last thing any of us want is to see our workshops go up in smoke. So this is my list of 12 things that I see that are common mistakes that new woodworkers make. And some of us make them for years. I mean, I'll be honest, some of these I made for 20, 30, even 40 years before I got out of that mode. The faster you get out of that mode, the quicker you'll get on to doing better stuff. So enjoy your woodworking. And let's see if we can at least avoid these mistakes 